The great boogeyman of global warming is melting ice and rising sea levels. The fear is that higher temperatures will melt glaciers and land-based ice packs, causing the sea to rise and inundate coastal settlements. And in this summer of 2007, it has been hard to avoid the news headlines that, quote, the North Pole ice pack is at its all-time low, unquote. One might respond to such a headline, really? The ice pack is at its lowest in six billion year history of Earth? And of course the answer is no, just the lowest since we've watched the ice by satellite, which started in 1979, not even 30 years ago. Yet another reminder of the slippery nature of what we call normal and climate. Oddly, though, the media somehow missed a second quite parallel story, because at the same time the North Pole ice pack was at a 28-year low, the South Pole ice pack on the same exact day was hitting a 28-year high. This conjunction of record low and record high is very hard to explain in the context of global warming, especially in light of the theories of polar amplification, but makes more sense given our previous discussion of warming being a mainly northern hemisphere phenomenon. Interestingly, when scientists have used various records to look back at Arctic ice pack size, they have found that Arctic ice pack seems to have been in decline for hundreds of years, since long before man began burning fossil fuels in earnest. Clearly, until 1940 or so, some natural process other than greenhouse gas emissions must have been driving this decline. So to get this relatively smooth, continuous trend, either the natural processes driving these declines ended exactly in 1940, at the exact same moment greenhouse gas-driven warming took over, or the current ice, Arctic ice declines are part of a natural, multi-century trend that may have little to do with greenhouse gases. In fact, a NASA study recently found that Arctic ice declines over the last two years had more to do with unusual wind patterns than any changing temperatures. Of course, the polar ice packs are interesting pro proxies for Arctic temperature changes. They actually have absolutely no effect on worldwide sea levels. Since sea ice floats, melting sea ice has no effect on ocean levels. Only land-based ice, of which 80 to 85 percent is in Antarctica, another 10 percent is in Greenland, the rest and other miscellaneous glaciers, can actually affect sea levels. People are most familiar with Greenland, whose ice pack has been treating over the last several years. Similarly, many glaciers worldwide also appear to be retreating. The question, however, is how much of this retreat can be blamed on man-made global warming rather than natural cyclical trends. After all, Greenland was green when the Vikings landed there centuries ago, and no one would blame fossil fuel consumption for that. The problem, again, is the question of what is normal. We have only really been carefully watching the ice pack in Greenland for a few decades, but do we, we do have longer observations for glaciers in other parts of the world. And while many are retreating, we have records going back to the 18th century that seem to say that most of this retreat happened before the fossil fuel era. This is a map of large glaciers at Glacier Bay, Alaska. You can see that much of the retreat of these glaciers over the last 300 years occurred before 1900. Again, we see a very similar story to what we saw in the Arctic. Yes, there have been some retreats, but these appear to be part of a much longer process that is unlikely to have anything to do with man. But even as the slow but steady melting of ice in Greenland and isolated glaciers tends to raise sea levels, there is one place in the world where every measurement and climate model shows the ice pack increasing, Antarctica. Antarctica is so cold that any foreseeable amount of global warming will not lower temperatures enough to begin melting ice. In turn, rising ocean temperatures tend to increase precipitation in Antarctica, therefore actually increasing ice as the world warms, counterbalancing the effect of melting in Greenland. I know that those of you who saw An Inconvenient Truth are now objecting that Al Gore showed you Antarctica melting. The Antarctic Peninsula, which juts out in the north, represents about 2% of the Antarctic land mass, and is in fact warming a bit. But this 2% is not at all representative of the other 98% of the continent. Guess which part of Antarctica Al Gore showed on the camera? As a result, even the UN IPCC, based on overblown warming forecasts of 6 to 8 degrees in the next century, predicts sea levels rising only about 18 inches the next 100 years. Using more realistic warming forecasts, we might expect oceans to rise less than a foot, or about the same amount they rose in the 20th century, and the 19th century, and in nearly every century before that since oceans have been rising slowly all the way back to the last ice age. And in fact, when you look at the detail behind their forecasts, you can see that melting ice is nearly irrelevant to the forecast. Antarctic ice growth offsets melting from Greenland and other glaciers. Almost all of the sea level rise actually comes from thermal expansion of heated oceans. 
If we admit that man-made global warming exists, does its magnitude even matter? Advocates of aggressive action to curb carbon dioxide often argue that even if we are not sure of the effects of man-made carbon dioxide, even the smallest chance of potentially dire outcomes justifies immediate and aggressive action. I disagree, because whatever potential costs and consequences and uncertainties of carbon dioxide emissions, the costs of aggressive limitations on CO2 production are both large and certain. Here's an example. The total income of the world's population today is about $60 trillion. Over the next 100 years, if real growth were to continue at 3.5% per year, the world economy will have grown over 30-fold, an enormous increase in wealth that will improve the lives of every person on Earth, not to mention our ability to deal with natural disasters. But artificially cutting back on car fossil fuel use, say through carbon taxes or outright restrictions, would have an enormous negative impact on this growth. The oil price shock of the 1970s, which were probably smaller than those needed to roll back CO2 emissions to 1990 levels, knocked over two and a half points off world economic growth. If, say through artificial restrictions on CO2 production, worldwide growth rates for the next century were reduced by one percentage point, say from 3.5% a year to 2.5% per year, the resulting world economy in a century will be 2.5 times smaller than it would have been. This is a world economy over a quadrillion dollars smaller. This is a huge amount of lost wealth and presents us with a stark choice. The trade-off we face is between a warmer but richer world and a cooler but poorer one. Is it better, for example, to have a world that has today's sea levels or a world with sea levels half a meter higher but with three times as many resources? Will temperatures that are a degree or two higher hurt society more or less than gas prices that might have to rise to $10 or $20 or even more a gallon to inhibit CO2 production? Would we prefer a couple fewer hurricanes a year? or an economy trillions of dollars larger to prepare for them. It is for this reason that not just the fact of greenhouse gas induced warming matters, but its magnitude is important as well. The cost to individual lives of sustained and dramatic efforts to limit CO2 production are at least as real as the hypothesized climate changes from fossil fuel combustion. Climate catastrophists know this, which is why they feel the need to exaggerate future disasters to justify these staggering costs. I will remind you of the words of one such catastrophist, National Center for Atmospheric Research climate researcher Stephen Schneider. Quote, we have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified, dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we may have. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. When our government-funded scientists take this approach, questioning whether they should even be honest with the public, maybe that helps explain why an amateur like myself feels the need to make this video. I hope this material has been helpful to you. You can learn more at my website www.climateskeptic.com. On that site you will find longer articles with sources on the topics discussed in this video, as well as links to websites on both sides of the climate debate. Thank you.